Dear Godin, your neck attachment system on your Seagull guitars, it's f censored. So this is a artist mosaic Seagull guitar made in Canada by Godin. And they also make uh, Larpa Tree, um, Patrick and Simon. I think there's one called Norman, which is kind of a weird name, but anyway. Uh, I used to work for the importer of Seagull and Godin guitars back in Australia in Sydney, Dynamic Music. And so I've reset a lot of necks on these guitars. And what they used to have as a neck system was basically like a Martin, but without a dovetail. Uh, it's what the early tailors were, the sort of 87 tailors were. It's just a butt joint and two bolts, and you just glued that down, and, and it was good. I think a dovetail or a tenon is better, but uh, a butt joint is fine. Do up, do up background music while you read this do up do wa do da -de da ba to compensate for some neck errors that they had when i was working there which was 2008 they added this this is what seagull call the integrated set neck and i do like the system it's very similar to the taylor system and what trevor gore talks about in his book however their systems are completely bolt-on and reversible and this is not so let's hear Robert Godin himself talk about it. The acoustic guitar, they all have the tendency at the 12th fret to do a little bump at the body. First, we put two dowel on the heel, dowel of maple up to here, to reinforce the heel. And we have a wedge here that we're going to glue epoxy here. We have to fit it perfect. And then the truss rod is going to go over and the fingerboard. I don't mind that. It does add some stability and stuff, but the problem is uh, twofold, probably threefold or fourfold. So I've sawn through this and we'll get to that later, but that was one piece of wood and you can see it goes into here. It goes in, you know, a couple of frets. Uh, what they've done since I was working at Dynamic Music, uh, they have, started doing this which is this big block of wood which is fine and together with the two bolts they epoxy this entire area into the pocket which makes getting the neck out an absolute bastard gonna put the glue and then she's gonna epoxy the neck you see this is epoxy then it's a set neck, it's not a bolt down neck. There is two bolt, but it's just for the gel time of the glue. After, they're useless. This is the first footage I have of the repair after it took the neck off, and it's before I sawed off the, uh, the under the fingerboard extension uh, block. And you can see how much epoxy they rely on to keep this whole joint from moving, but it doesn't work for all the reasons that I'm about to explain. If you've ever tried to get out a neck that is epoxied in it's difficult like a dovetail epoxy or something but when it's down here like this sort of almost an inch deep just over three quarters of an inch it is really stupid what godin have effectively created is a les paul neck except it gets worse it's a les paul neck glued in with epoxy the other thing that is troublesome is this thing pretend it's still stuck to here. When I pulled it out, which I didn't get footage of or anything, I decided to do this video because this whole thing annoyed me so much. <laughs> and I noticed when I orientated this back, when I put this in, it rocked. So the join in here, it's almost like a really badly shimmed electric neck. You know how people put credit card, like a strip of credit card at one end? And then it's just all this air <laughs> down to here. Uh, that's exactly what it was, which shocked me. And to fill up these weird voids, which shouldn't exist, they use an abundance of epoxy, which is just a really bad construction practice. 
So this is a far less sophisticated system than what Taylor uses, which is a series of uh, angled spaces to ensure that they get no gaps and that it's a 100% wood-to-wood -wood contact. And the system that Trevor Gore uses is a more complicated system that is kind of integrated into the build. It doesn't use shims, but he aligns the neck and then routes a pocket that is absolutely perfectly fitting the bottom of the fretboard and the bottom of the head block. Another reason why this failed is because the bottom of this head block extension is only about five mils deep this way and the walls are only about a quarter of an inch deep so when you have a nice large head block that's great I like a nice large head block uh, it gives support and stability to the entire area this this is like the most you need to keep the geometry of this correct. If this starts folding in, everything just goes to hell. The trouble is the head block extension is weak because it's so thin. The transverse brace here, there is about a quarter of an inch gap, which I'm going to fill with this piece of mahogany. I'm first gonna glue that in, and that will take up the space between the end of the head block and the transverse brace so that's that's going to shore up this entire area from twisting a little bit which is just a nice bonus so what's happened with this guitar is because this whole thing was just so badly made this entire area collapsed in on itself and so it had the cracks down either side of the fingerboard get to that later and uh and this has popped down. I made this jig, which I used originally on a Taylor guitar, to use the existing bolt holes and just clamp the hell out of it. I pulled this area back and glued it in place, and I'm gonna leave this here until I do a few other things. The only thing I've done is put in a little patch just here to shore up the end of the fingerboard. This whole system can be made good, but it has to start good, or it should start good from the factory, which this wasn't. I have a workaround. What I'm gonna do, why I took this out, so I sawed this off after I thought about it for two seconds. What I'm gonna do is make this into basically a normal guitar. I'm gonna keep the original uh, piece of mahogany that I got from under the fingerboard because it's already got the truss rod slot in it but it's a little bit low because I had to plane it flat and uh, make it nice for gluing so I just have to uh, pack that out and I'm going to use two 60 thou shims they will go in there the other thing it has side slot and it's about 20 thou each side. So what I'm also going to do is glue in two veneers on either side of the of this shim. And it's a, still a little bit loose, but that with the glue, it'll be good. Then I'm going to plane this whole mess down. Then I'll have a seagull guitar, which was like the seagulls that I was working on in the early 2000s. And I'll just be able to, if it needs a uh, neck reset, I can just take a little bit of uh, wood off the bottom here and just glue this straight on to what will be just one plane of strong wood that's all glued together. The better way to do it is to not use all these shims and stuff. The best way to do it would be to make a brand new one of these which fit exactly in every direction but uh, this is fine with glue it's it's fine so if you need to take off a golden or seagull neck I would suggest you convert it back to what is kind of an original type of neck joint and absolutely don't re epoxy this whole block into that crevice because that is just um, 
it almost makes the guitar a throwaway guitar then because you just can't get it out unless you I got lucky with this I was using the Stumac neck puller and it slowly cracked out so I was quite lucky but in future I am going to be very wary of doing neck resets or any work neck work on a Seagull guitar again another feature that is quite common with factory built guitars and even luthier built guitars the head block and the extension they just go straight down they just go straight down like this they're parallel with the grain in other words and that exacerbates a major problem in a lot of guitars which is what this has and what led to the catastrophic failure that this is when the whole thing falls into the sound hole the top it cracked along the fingerboard edges and then it just lost rigidity and it, the entire thing just fell into the sound hole. So on all my guitars, so I don't have a guitar body here, but I've got a ukulele that I'm making and you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. All my head blocks fare outwards. So they're, they're basically wedge shaped like this and it doesn't have to be extreme, but what it does and should need to be, and I really encourage luthiers and repairers and especially factories to do this you just want the the side of the head block extension or the head block to fare out a little bit more just a couple of grain lines at least if it's crossing over a few grain lines then that's that's great if it's running parallel with the grain line you're gonna get cracks that's just what happens so just use a wedge, slightly wedged extension, head block extension or head block, and it'll at least minimize this problem. Also, the head block absolutely needs to be wider than the fingerboard. Let's measure it. The head block itself is four inches wide, which is good. That is that wide. So plenty of space. It's like two inches or an inch on either side. But here comes the bad news. The... <laughs> yep, it really is. It literally is. So if I'm measuring the fingerboard here, it's 55 mil. And guess what the extension width is? It's exactly 55 mil. So um, it's like the worst thing to do. Go and come on. You're smarter than that. Anyway, don't do what you seagull do and make the head block extension exactly the same width as the fingerboard and not flare it out if you make it wider and flare it out it really 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 minimizes this problem and especially when you butt the uh, head block extension up against the transverse brace that really shores up the entire area is just as best as engineering can make it without pouring concrete into it <laughs> all right i'm gonna glue this up now Okay, so let's backtrack a bit. This is the original state that I got the guitar in. You can see the sound hole was caved in and I haven't even uh, cut off the, the block yet. This is the mess that I found when I did it and that's after I had re-established the top back into alignment. And it was after I took that off, I realized that it was rocking and uh, noticed how much uh, space there was. It was like you know one to two thirty seconds or mils of uh, gap that they'd filled up with epoxy so i just needed to remove as much of that as i could so i could get you know a strong good wood to wood contact when i re-glued everything in uh, and the block was a little bit damaged uh, so i just had to plane that flat and then when i did it was obviously too low again i mentioned before that it's better to just add a completely new block to this but I wanted to keep this original one because of the uh, truss rod route but I made everything really tight fitting so it was as good as a, a nice fitting block so this is a dry run and then I add some glue so that's the quarter inch uh, shim that I put between the transverse brace and the head block extension that's a very important piece and then you know the first shim second shim block than the two veneers on either side of the block and then just leave that overnight to dry it's the next day and off with the clamps 
better already. So before I took the big head block extension um, fixer upper jig out, I added two more cleats to the very upper bout uh, just to try and shore up the entire area a bit more. Now I can finally take this big jig off. I try and leave this on for as long as I can uh, while I'm gluing up everything because there's so much tension on the top. It can be problematic to take this jig off too early because then the whole thing could just fall back in on itself if you're not, you know, if you haven't done a good glue up job. Now I just have to take a block plane and carefully take this down so it's flush with the rest of the top. It's fitting really nicely. It looks great. The neck angle is good as is, so I don't need to do anything about that. Seagull also use putty to hide or fill any inconsistencies in the cheek of the heel, but that doesn't need to be addressed. I thought I'd need to floss it a tiny bit, but it's good. And the neck angle is good. Um, so I'm just gonna glue this straight on right now. All right, so I'm effectively back to square one. I have a head block and head block extension that's really shored up and is a solid chunk of wood now, which is gonna be strong. So I'm just gonna uh, glue on this neck per usual. Uh, the only difference is it's got two 10 mil bolts and uh, not a tenon or a dovetail. So the back call is just slightly tapered to match the sort of radius of the back. So the back and the top can be clamped uh, evenly and just snug up one bolt and then the second bolt clamp the give it some downward pressure then further tighten up the two bolts and then add the last clamp and perfect and now it's just clean up time typical so i just used tight bond or actually i used lmi glue for this if this was an old guitar i would have used hot high glue for that job but no need for this leave that overnight and string it up tomorrow so here is the finished repair the neck join is now what i would consider a normal neck joint it's just uh, a neck with a butt joint heel connected to a top which has a now solidified and strong head block taking care of all these idiotic problems that were introduced in the manufacturing process. The action's about two and a quarter, 30 seconds on the bass side and two 30 seconds on the treble side, so exactly where I like it. And the saddle is still three mils, an eighth of an inch up, so everything's good. This is now optimal. <laughs> I took the nut slots down a touch and the relief is about six thou. So now we have a good guitar. like, subscribe, comment, all that sort of thing. See you next time. Bye.